This is the America's Quarterly Podcast. I'm Brian Winter. Four months after Javier Millet's inauguration, Argentina is in a deep recession and inflation continues to eat away at salaries. So why has the president so far maintained his popularity in several polls? And so why is it that they're sticking with him? Well, I think there are several factors. And the first one, I would say it has to do with the fact that, you know, whatever is on the other side, it's significantly worse than whatever Millet has done up until now. And so in order for me to cross the river into this awful country I don't really want to go to, you know, the stakes have to be really, really high for me to do that. A somewhat surprising thing is happening in Argentina right now. Since Javier Millet took office in December, life for a lot of Argentines has become even more difficult. Real salaries have fallen by more than 20% since December. A huge deterioration in purchasing power comparable to what the country lived through in the infamous crisis of 2001. Inflation is running above 270% on an annual basis the peso has devalued, and yet President Millet's approval rating is still about 50%, down only slightly since December, according to top polling firm Isonomia. Some other polls have shown a similar dynamic. If you know Argentina's history and its traditional lack of patience with presidents who try to make cuts, ajustes, in government spending, it's more surprising still. Today on the podcast, we're going to look at why Millet, at least so far, has maintained popular support. We'll talk about the state of his pro-market agenda, much of which is stuck in Congress, and look at its chances of passing in months to come. We'll talk a bit about Javier Millet on the global stage. He's been to the U.S. five times this year and recently met with Elon Musk. We have a great guest, Ana Iparraguirre, is a partner at GBAO Strategies, a public opinion research and political strategy firm. She follows the big political trends in Argentina and the small daily political events as well. Ana, welcome back to the AQ Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. So Ana, as I said in the introduction, life is, is difficult, still tougher in some ways in Buenos Aires at the moment. But we still see these polls suggesting that Javier Millet's popularity is quite high. Why? Well, there's several factors that can explain that. But let me start by putting a note of caution on that statement that all of us are looking at. Approval is not vote. So we're heading into midterm elections next year. And as you know, and you probably see in the U.S., not necessarily like the approval that a president has translates into the vote and support that he's going to have. Now, the one thing that to me is very surprising, that his approval, it's in the low 50s. So it's like well beyond his loyalists, the people who are sticking with him. And so why is it that they're sticking with him? Well, I think there are several factors. And the first one, I would say it has to do with the fact that, you know, whatever is on the other side, it's significantly worse than whatever Millet has done up until now. And so in order for me to cross the river into this awful country I don't really want to go to, you know, the stakes have to be really, really high for me to do that. The other part is like when you talk to voters, they feel, you know, Millet is doing what he said he was going to do. So he's fulfilling his promises. He told us he was going to do this. That is why we voted for him. And the third thing I would say is that, you know, voters understand. In fact, you know, we were doing focus groups this week. And one of the things we hear over and over is like, you know, the problems that we're facing took many years to build. So if it took many years to build them, it's going to take a while to undo all that work. But I must say the one thing that to me is a novelty and is something that's starting to emerge right now is that voters perceive the changes as too abrupt, not planned enough, and uh, I wouldn't say too drastic, but too unorganized. 
especially I'd say there's a note of caution with the role that, you know, the business community is playing. Argentina has historically been very skeptical of business leaders. And I think, you know, many people are seeing Millet as not really regulating them enough. And that is clearly like a problem for a libertarian president. I want to come back to that. But first, I, I want to, you mentioned the midterms. And it's funny, when I talk about Millet's popularity numbers, I'm not thinking of him getting to next year. I'm thinking of him getting to May, <laughs> right? Because this has been a phantasm, a, a ghost that lingers over him and lots of other Argentine presidents. I mean, there's this statistic, which We've repeated a couple times on this show before, but bears repeating again. Since the 1920s, only one non peronist democratically elected president has finished his term. That was Mauricio Macri fairly recently. But the memory of Fernando de la Rua in 2001 and Alfonsín having to leave early in 1989, that's always present. So, you know, the question becomes, what is Millet's job security like? And what I'm hearing is that he, he still... I mean, there are people are are giving him a chance. Everyone you talk to, ask, and everyone I talk to asked me that same question. Well, how long can he survive? Here we have a tension, I believe, between three pillars, right? I think it's like, you know, pocket, heart, and mind. So the heart we already talked about, people are still giving him credit because they believe whatever alternative there is, is worse than him. But then there's two other variables, right, that create tension. And the first one has to do with economy. And I'm going to leave that one aside because, you know, if I knew what's going to happen with the Argentine economy, I'd be really rich, but I'm not. So I'm going to go into the minds. And to me, the minds and the brain is, you know, the system, the political system. And so Argentines did something very strange, like 56% voted for Millet for president. But he has zero governors of his political party. That's the first time in history. He's got only about, you know, 15, 20 percent of Congress when on average a president since 83 have held up almost half of Congress and still they had all these institutional problems. I believe his team, Karina Millet, his sister, they are understanding that this is the weakest part of their government and that they need to strengthen it. Now, how can it, they strengthen it? Well, they're looking to make political deals, but they're not very keen on that. And they don't really trust the people they have to make deals with. They understand that even making a deal with Macri, that's not enough. So they're advancing on the Supreme Court. They just nominated two new candidates for the Supreme Court. One of them suggests there may be an agreement with the Kirchneristas. And then they are also starting to build their political party. Karina Millet has started to move in this direction. And that creates another tension because if they're building their own party, what's in it for, you know, Macri's party, for the pro? Are they going to give us peace on the list next year? We're going to stay out of everything. And so I believe this is a portion where Millet understands he's the weakest and he needs to build some sort of strength. And he's hoping he can make it to the midterms next year. So he's certainly going to get more political institutional power in the next elections, regardless of whether he does like a great election or a bad election. He'll have more than he does right now, which is... Oh my God. Yeah, exactly. And so if he can make it there, well... He has to survive May, as you said, (laughs) Brian, we'll see if that happens. But I think he's thinking, how do I make of that election an opportunity to build the brain for this structure that I have right now? Ana, can you tell me a little bit more about how he's doing in terms of building the consensus that he needs? Because there is some chatter in the Argentine press about the midterms next year, but that's a long way off. And he's He is trying to move forward on some of these reforms before then because because he needs to, because without them, he's not going to get the economic stability that that will keep him in office. The most worrying thing that I have seen in this category from Millet was now more than a month ago when he attacked Ricardo Lopez Murphy, who is one of the most market business friendly 
people in the Argentine Congress should be a Millet ally. And Millet attacked him as a traitor and human trash. And this really got my attention because it was kind of a sign. It, it reinforced this question that many people had from the very beginning with Millet, which was, hmm, even if he has the right ideas about what's necessary to fix Argentina's economy, does he have the right temperament? Sitting here today, do you think that he has learned anything in office? How is he doing when it comes to that day-to-day retail politics of putting together the kind of coalition that he needs in order to govern? He did an interview that I found fascinating this past week with Fantino. For our non-Argentine audience, Alejandro Fantino is an Argentine radio and TV host. In a part of the interview, he says, look, Alejandro, this there's something amazing going on in Argentina. We used to think that Peronists were cabeza de termos, right? Which is like a way of saying that they were like idiots, you know, that they didn't, that they were just like idiots. But no, but they had it right. They understood what's going on. The problem is when you get power, there are other people that are going to come and they want to try to get that power away from you. I was like, well, welcome to politics, right? <laughs> Anyone who's been in politics for like 60 seconds knows that it is that way. Right. If you've seen like Lord of the Rings, you know that it's going to be that way. (laughs) But this was a revelation for him. But this was a revelation for him because he doesn't come from that world. He doesn't think that way. And so I believe that that's part of what's going on. But that creates another problem, a problem that's not only a problem for him and from Argentines, but a problem for the rest of the political class. He doesn't have all those restrictions. But the problem is that because he doesn't have all those restrictions, the rest of the political system doesn't know what to do. They don't know what to do because they don't know how he's going to act. And there's no rational, you know, uh, chess game, you know, that you say he's going to do this and then I'm going to do that. And there's no conversation there. Can you map out for us who is willing to work with Millet at this point on some of these reforms? You mentioned Former President Macri earlier, I think everybody in our audience understands that those are natural allies for him. Maybe there's some complications there that you can speak to, but who else is talking to him? Is this deal that we saw uh, that you mentioned that suggests that maybe he's talking to the the Kirchnerists? I mean, is there is there potential there? How do you see the map right now? Well, it is uncertain because, as you know, in the middle of these negotiations, what, you know, politicians say is not necessarily what they're going to do, what they're really negotiating behind doors. So I I personally have no clarity on that. What it looks like, and I'm going to, you know, put an extra emphasis, looks like, which, you know, may end up not being what happens, is that Millet could count with his blog, regardless of whether they are fragmented or not, but he could count with his blog, support from Macri's political party, he's going to have support from part of the UCR, from the radicals. And that's about it, or what he's got in his pocket. Now, there comes the most difficult conversation, right? So he needs to get some governors on board. But the governors now understood the political power. And as you can see today, as we were speaking, there is a meeting between the governors from the central region. Santa Fe, Entre Rios, and Córdoba. They're getting together to negotiate with Millet as a block of governors and not as individual governors. The governors from the Patagonia, from the South, did something similar. I think there is a need to get to an agreement because many of these provinces really need the funds that the federal government has to transfer to them. But, and here is like my main question is, we are all assuming that the senators and diputados from those provinces respond to the governor of that province. And I believe in many provinces that's not the case. And many of the diputados are thinking, who is going to guarantee me that next year I'm going to be in some sort of list of some sort of party in a role where I could, you know, renovate my city in Congress. I believe, you know, that makes the negotiations especially difficult. And you should add to that difficulty the fact that Millet keeps, as you say, 
harassing, to say the least, all the people that he re- would really need on board. So he keeps saying that, that they are crooks, that they're corrupt, that they, you know, don't understand, that they are the kata, whatever it is. And there are personal relationships in politics. So many of these people are deeply offended. They don't want to be, you know, to receive those insults, regardless of their convenience. So I think, you know, there's no clarity on that. If you ask me, I think today he does not have the numbers. There's a path how he could get there, but it's going to be, it's going to require a tremendous amount of pragmatism from Millet, and he would have to concede a lot. So you've mapped things out very skillfully. Let's see if we can look at the bottom line as far as some of these reforms go. Over the course of this year, let's think about 2024, long way to go still. What do you expect him to get past on this, you know, long list of things? And I'm sure part of our audience is confused because the, you referenced the omnibus bill and it came back. Parts of it were rejected. I mean, just to sort of reset here for a second, which parts of Millet's agenda do you expect to go forward in the next couple of months, if any? Well, I think, you know, the first omnibus bill was like, let's throw it everything in there and just get them confused and see what happens, right? But I think there are some things that are a priority for Millet, and those things have to do with the economy, like especially the fiscal deficit. And in order to do that, he needs to focus on passing the fiscal bill, which is, you know, taxes and all that that has to go through Congress. Second of all, I'd say, you know, all the bills that have to do with, you know, pension reform, privatizations, everything that would allow Millet to reduce government spending and the superpowers, what they call here superpowers, which are a special permits that the Congress gives the executive in order to be able to operate without, you know, having to go back to Congress all the time because of all of the, these difficulties that we already mentioned. I'd say that's the most important thing for Millet, and I believe those are the most important things for the rest of the political system. All the other things is candy, even abortion. I think like the whole discussion about abortion is just like, you know, it's not on the agenda right now. He's not going to move forward with that unless, unless he truly gets blocked on his whole economic agenda, in which way the only thing that he'd have in hand is to appeal to his most radical base. You mentioned earlier, Anna, this sensitivity that he's facing in terms of his relationships with the business community. We said we'd come back to that. Tell me about that. Why is that a major issue for him? Well, to me, that is fascinating, and it's something that's going on right now. So just to give you some perspective, historically in Argentina, Argentines have always been very skeptical of the private sector. There's an Ipsos study where they ask how much, you know, people trust business leaders. Well, in Argentina, it's only 18%. It's the third country with least trust in business leaders overall in this global study. That has always been present. And that's why the Kishners used that to say like, look, these are the bad guys. These are the guys who are like increasing prices, who are taking advantage, who are making like record profits. These are the guys we really have to regulate because they are the responsible for you not doing well. What happened? Mille came to power and said like, okay, so now you're free. I'm going to take off your handcuffs. The market is going to self-regulate. Let's see what happens. Well, what happened was that, you know, health insurances skyrocketed. There was scarcity of uh, repellent for mosquitoes during a dengue epidemic. And so people are defaulting to their initial fears. We didn't trust these guys to start with, and now you're letting them do whatever they want. And, you know, they're not doing good things. We don't like it. The finance minister said last week, of the libertarian government said last week that business leaders have gone too far with their prices and that they are declarating the war on the middle class. This is the finance minister of a libertarian president telling this to business leaders. As a response to that, this weekend, if you look at the newspapers, you had the biggest beer company in Argentina saying they were going to declare a prices pact with Argentines to keep prices flat for three months. 
many supermarkets decided to do their own precios cuidados, not required by the government, but they are self-regulating. So precios protegidos, precios corajudos, different names, but the same sort of thing. To say, okay, 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 we're not the bad guys. Look, we want to do something. We want to help you. We want to work with you. Don't come regulate us. Because they know that Argentines want more regulation, not less. And so Millet is in like this very difficult problem. Like, what does he do? He's a libertarian. And there's an amazing paper that I read this weekend from the Carnegie Endowment that compares the relationship between business leaders and right-wing populist uh, presidents in Brazil, Hungary, and uh, India. And what they found is like, they may do campaign as being pro-business and right-wing, but once they're in office, well, then they mix, you know, right-wing policies like, you know, deregulating with very left-wing policies like, you know, nationalizations, uh, tariffs, and all sorts of things to protect the local industry. And I think Millet is in that in-between, and I just read it in the paper before this conversation, they said they were going to start an investigation on why the health insurances increase their prices so much. So that's a, a very interesting ideological dilemma for, you know, the first libertarian president of humanity, as Millet likes to call himself. Well, and to your point, it sounds less libertarian and more like the other label that you used, which is right-wing populist, which we've seen in, in several other countries. So it's interesting. It sounds like there's a, a battle for his soul still ongoing. We're, we're coming to the end here, but I do want to ask you just a general question here. What is the feeling on the street in Buenos Aires right now? You've talked about this a little bit, but to be going through one of these very difficult economic periods, I mean, the, the destruction of buying power, you know, a silly example, I, I have Argentine friends who are middle class, upper middle class in some cases, who are doing things like dropping gym memberships because they can't afford it anymore because they're having to cut back. And that may seem like a small thing to people in our audiences, but it reflects the kinds of ways that people in the middle class are having to tighten their buckle right now. What have you seen and heard on the ground there? I'd say, you know, yes, that is happening, but there's a surprising level of resistance. And people saying like, okay, you know, we're going to hang on. We're going to wait, you know, a little, a little longer. And why is that? Well, I think, you know, several reasons. But the first one is there's no clarity on, you know, if not Millet, what? For anyone, there's no clarity for the people. So if not Millet, what? You know, what's my alternative? And there's no clarity for the political systems, even for unions. If not Millet, what? Who comes next? You know, if Millet doesn't do well, I mean, who in, you know, the whole like political spectrum that we're seeing right now, who benefits from a failure? There's no clarity. And so there's no real incentive to push him in that direction. So I think, you know, that what we're hearing in the streets and what you see is, yeah, you go to, you know, in the Conurbano, you go to, you know, uh, places where they feed people and there are more people there. There are people who used not to go there that now they go and they feel uncomfortable because they don't want to self-identify as poor. They feel they are like, you know, they're workers and not poor. And they think, you know, all this is going on. But until there is an alternative, I think it's very difficult to think that people are just going to jump to an abyss. And, and the Kushneristas led now by Axel Kisilov, the governor of Provincia de Buenos Aires, they've been fairly quiet, right? Well, I'm going to go as a, I mean, I'm not sure Kisilov is leading that yet. I think there is a struggle there. What's the Peronism going to be? You have Malena Galmarini's, like, master's wife saying, we need to reform Peronism, we need to think about a new Peronism, regardless of whether she's the right voice to lead that change or not. And then you've got more, you know, uh, typical like Kirchner, if that, like Kisilov, who also faced some confrontation with people from his own party in this past 
in this past week. And then you also have Peronist governors who say like, OK, you know, now it's our turn. You know, you try. We tried Kishinev before. Now let's go to a different type of Peronism now or the old type of Peronism. Final question for you. For those of us who follow Latin American politics, the person of the week last week arguably was Elon Musk, uh, who was very active in Brazilian politics uh, with his rhetoric about free speech and the platform that he owns, X. And of course, he met with Javier Millet as well when Millet was in the United States. But what is, how do you view Millet's interactions with figures like Elon Musk? Of course, he spoke at the CPAC conference, the conservative conference in the United States. What is he trying to get out of that? I'm not really sure, but let me tell you what I do know. We did focus groups this week while Millet was like meeting with Elon Musk. I didn't have even one person in the focus groups, you know, saying they, you know, have seen or heard that. One of Millet's strategies is to constantly dominate the agenda. And the week before he's meeting with Elon Musk and going to fly this new jet in Europe and all that, he was losing control of the agenda for the first time. You know, the, the things that we were discussing were not the things that Millet wanted to discuss. And I think, you know, this reinforces somehow his position as a rebel, right? Someone who's anti-system, who goes against the rules, who's willing to do what other people are not willing to do, who has some sort of like dream of where Argentina needs to go, what Argentina needs to be. That's something new that has not been done before. And in some way, you know, he compares himself to Elon Musk and says, okay, Millet thought um, Elon Musk, you know, dreamt with these electric cars. And at the end of the day, he created something that was not there before him. So I think, you know, those are the associations. I am very skeptical of what impact, what direct impact that has in Argentina for him. But I think, you know, this is changing geopolitics for Argentina. I mean, the fact that in a bipolar world, Millet has so decisively aligned with the U.S. and with Israel is really something very different from Argentina that we had not experienced before because the last time was with Carlos Menem, but that was a, was not a, a multipolar world, right? That was like a different world. So I think, you know, the risks of the strategy that he's pursuing now for Argentina are significantly greater. Anna, thank you so much for joining us on the AQ Podcast. Thank you, Brian. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the America's Quarterly Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review, give us a rating, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The America's Quarterly Podcast is produced by Luisa Franco and edited in partnership with Human Group Media.